This show is made possible by our Patreon supporters. To get access to our exclusive content and support the show, visit www.patreon.com forward slash EABB podcast. That's www.patreon.com forward slash EABB podcast. Thanks. <laughs> Welcome to the Early American Brass Band Podcast. I'm Chris Troiano, joined always by Stephen Canistracy. Hello. This is episode 42, and today we are speaking with Dr. Tom C. Owens. Dr. Owens is the Associate Director of the School of Music at George Mason University. He is also the Associate Professor and Coordinator of Music, History, and Literature at George Mason University School of Music. Dr. Owens is the editor of Selected Correspondence of Charles Ives, available through the University of California Press, and he's also a member of the board of the Charles Ives Society. We are really honored and excited to have Dr. Owens on our podcast for this episode where we will discuss Charles Ives and George Ives. Many of you might know Charles Ives as one of the quintessential American composers, uh, and George Ives was his father, and it's great to get a lot of perspective from someone who has done a lot of work looking at the relationship between the two through the letters and correspondence that they uh, sent back and forth. So we're very grateful for uh, Dr. Owens' insight. And without further ado, we'll just hop right on into the episode. Thank you so much to Dr. Tom C. Owens for joining us today on the Early American Brass Band Podcast. Dr. Owens, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm great. Thank you for having me. Of course. We're really excited that we got the opportunity to have you on today. Uh, Stephen and I, uh, as our listeners know, both have gone or are going through <laughs> the system at George Mason University. <laughs> have, we've had the, uh, the honor and the pleasure of having... I've had one class. Stephen, I don't know. Have you had more than one class with Dr. Owens? Uh, no, just the same class that you yeah. took. Uh, yeah, so... Keyboard music of Charles Ives. Great class. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and chamber. Keyboard and chamber. Keyboard, keyboard and chamber. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So uh, as people can tell by the title of today's episode, we're going to be doing a lot of Ives talk today and something that we're really excited to, to get to share uh, with our listeners. So, Dr. Owens, before we get into uh, George and Charles Ives, can you maybe give us a little brief background on your musical upbringing and what kind of drew you to the music of Charles Ives? Sure. Um, well, I grew up in a smallish town in North Carolina called Hickory. And um, uh, my parents are both musical. My mother is or was a choir director and an a church organist, um, occasional church organist, and my dad played the clarinet, and um, they sang in choirs, and so I started taking piano lessons, and I sang in choirs. I, I was in the seventh grade, the eighth grade band. I played. Um, the, I started on the trumpet, then I switched to the baritone, uh, but then I didn't want. I didn't want to march, so I did. <laughs> I didn't go on into, into <laughs> high school. Um, just stuck to the playing the piano, and then I went to. Um, Went to college at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, which is sort of one of the two music-oriented um, schools in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, and started off as a piano major, and then discovered that I was better at writing papers than I was. You know, I liked writing papers more than I liked to play concerts, and that was a problem for a future as a pianist. So mm -hmm. um, I switched over to a music history major. In my sophomore year, which was a really strange thing to decide to do, um, and somehow that worked out. I mean, if if I'm sure if someone had looked at like statistics, it would be like this is not Well, I don't know. They're both insane career choices. So, um, anyhow, good, thing, uh, good thing you got off of playing the baritone. Was that would have been e equally yeah, uh, yeah, dangerous? Yeah. <laughs> take it, take it from the two of us. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> 
And I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But, um, <laughs> it was. I enjoyed it. We had this great solo in this, in this piece called "The Golden Age of Rock and Roll." I still remember that little, nice. the little baritone awesome. solo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's actually anyway. on military band excerpt now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for, for the elementary military band. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so then I went to graduate school. Um, I, went, I went to Yale largely because the Ives um, archive was there and they let me in. So that was nice. Um, <laughs> and But how I got into Ives, I my friend Keith uh, was sort of an amazing piano player. He's, I think he's two years older than I am. And so he was in college when I was still in high school, and he was playing the, the Ives' first piano sonata. Um, and he used to like to come over to our house because we had a grand piano. So he would, <laughs> he would come over and play. And I just thought that was the coolest piece. I'm like, oh my God, this is so amazingly yeah. really cool. Yeah. And so that was what I, what I got her thought. And then I had to come up with something to do a paper on. Uh, my senior thesis in, in college, I was like, oh, I'll just do Ives, that'd be fun. And I'm still doing it. Yeah, that's awesome. So it was his piano music specifically that drew you to him, or were you able to eventually? Well, yeah, actually, eventually. Was, I know you did find his other music <laughs> as well. Yeah, it was it was specifically the the ragtime movements of mm-hmm. the first piano sonata. The yeah, the ragtime version of bringing in in the sheaves was the mm-hmm. thing that totally hooked me. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a great movement. It it's, it it uh. I don't, don't want to say comes out of nowhere, but it, it definitely turns your ear up a little bit with yeah. uh, with hearing that ragtime influence in that piece. And that was a lot of fun when you were showing us that uh, a few years ago. Yeah. So in in terms of then your interest with Charles Ives, I know you just said you, you went to Yale uh, partially or entirely because of, of that connection. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just kind of silly if you're going to study Ives without fairly certain I was going to, to go anywhere else uh, because they had all of his manuscript materials are there. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I was able to just walk into the, it used to be that they were just kept in the office of the music librarian because it was yeah. the only place in the old music library that had air conditioning. And uh-huh. so they kept all the, the stuff that was fragile in, in Ken Frilly's office. So you would just walk in there and, um, oh, I want to look at the Fourth Symphony. Okay, I just grab that box. And, yeah, know, yeah. But, wow. Uh, so that was pretty amazing. It was like yeah. living in a candy store. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure that process is a little different now. They there, right? they have um yeah now everything they they have a, a a very nice new music library which of course was um, built right after I left because that's the way yeah. it always works. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, everything now is is much um, is kept in much better conditions, and I mean it, it's still I think pretty pretty open if you're a student there or if you are a scholar. I mean I've had people like uh, uh, June McDonald, who's doing Ives, Ives work, has gone up there and done research. It's it's um it, they're they're a lot less um, restrictive than many places are about you know, granting access to the collection. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I went there and. Um, I didn't really know exactly what I was going to do, but I, it was just a, I was able to, to use the stuff. I, I took a class on editing and I was able to do an edition of uh, a song um, mm-hmm. from roughly three songs um, from the you know, just go in there and get the, get the manuscripts and figure it out. And that, yeah, well, so that was you know, that was really cool. And then I ended up doing my, my dissertation on, on Ives, sort of the, the idea of what what he thought um, what people of his time thought Americanness was, because you know, I was always has always been called, or very often been called, an American composer, a quintessentially American composer. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to figure out what, um, like, what did that mean? How did people talk about American um, kind of content in art mm-hmm. uh, and literature and art and music? And then how mm-hmm. how was Ives, uh, how how was Ives's um, music described kind of in those in that context did it fit or was there something that was different and the really interesting thing is when people would just say stuff about it that wasn't true because it tracked with a trope or with an idea that was constituted as american so they would sort of bend the biography to to make it fit like oh he didn't really have much european training or or he was self-taught or um like, like that's not really exactly true but that was a thing that was that fit with kind of what ideas of American art was then. Mm-hmm. 
still is to some extent. Um, and so that that was the kind of stuff I was I was interested in. And so I was also trying to figure out what um what he himself like how he himself talked about this kind of thing. So one mm-hmm. of the things I decided to do was to read through all of his letters, which the which the library had, mm-hmm. um, and that ended up um, resulting in the correspondence book that I did um, after I finished. Um, you know, after I finished finished school, I got the job at George Mason, and you, know, you have to write a book. That's one of the things <laughs> that you do, yeah, you um, or you know, several books even. But um, mm. so I just went through and made a selection of of letters to and from Ives and edited them. Which, if you've looked at his handwriting, is not the easiest <laughs> thing in the world to do. Um, and um, yeah, so that's how that that's how that worked. I'm wondering why Yale seems to be more. Uh, transparent and accessible to Ives's music compared to other composers, and then maybe diving into a little bit more of what you discovered of what it means to uh, this idea of Americanness, and I'm wondering if that can be applied to the larger topic of our show here with American brass bands. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't think the, the, on the access thing. I, I think that they, I don't think that they're more willing to let people see Ives stuff than other stuff. I think they just have a fairly um, I mean, they don't just let anybody off the street come in and look at stuff. Mm-hmm. But but if you um, you know if you have a reason a reasonable um, uh, you know just, I'm I'm this student from this school and I'm studying this stuff that they they have a fairly good access policy. I think now almost everything or many things are digitized, which they True. weren't when yeah. I was there. Mm-hmm. So it's it's much easier to see stuff even without going in and, and looking at the. Um, in you know, the actual materials, and they, they do. They have um, all the music manuscripts are well. Originally, they were um, all photostatted. They were all copied, uh, and you could look at that um, or, or look at microfilm of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that sort of would be the first step, step. And then, if you're really serious, then you're writing an article or a book or something, then they would let you look at the gotcha. at the real thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Makes sense. So, I, and I think that's not that uh, unusual in terms, you know, in terms of research libraries. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, yeah, the Americanness, I, that's, that is a pretty big topic to try to dive into. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was a lot of um, this idea that America was, was young and kind of unconnected. So American art needs to be unconnected from, uninfluenced by uh, European art. And so that what was looked at was like maybe it's art that has something to do with the west or the, this idea of pioneering or of freedom or individualism so a lot of a lot of the things that you kind of think of as you know, if you sort of think of what is an american uh, you know um it would be someone who was um not overly influenced not overly academic um individualistic um the whole thing of the New England transcendentalists that Ives was so into, um, that was often, like, like those figures, people like Emerson or Thoreau or uh, Walt Whitman were all kind of evoked as American originals. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I looked at, like there was an, an artist um, uh, just a little bit older than Ives, uh, Albert Pinkham Ryder, um, who um, was really, had this really distinctive um, slightly surreal but romantic kind of style and, and was he was in in a very similar way to I was portrayed as being untrained or you know essentially deriving his genius from his own kind of you know, out of the American soil or something um, <laughs> and um, he so it was interesting to I did a chapter where I compared biographies of writer and biographies of Ives and looked at them in the context of these tropes or these ideas of, of Americanness that I had found. And the, the really interesting thing is that where there are exaggerations or omissions in, in both of them, they tend to track with things that fit. Um, mm-hmm. Some people are trying to portray them as American and this is the context or the kind of the cookie cutter that you have to put them yeah. into. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's that's the way it works. And I don't think people are doing this consciously. Uh, it's just kind of the the way you think about something is molded by the context within which you um, you are are working, and so if you have a set of facts and you know five of them agree and two of them don't, you just don't necessarily say as much about the two that don't. Yeah, um, yeah, of course. 
So was the idea of Americanness being so detached from the its prior European history mostly smoke and mirrors that that ended up not really being the case? Well, I mean, everything's detached to everything. And there's, there's I mean, if you look at um, the music establishment, there's a huge amount of influence and connection. Um, and even the like composers like you know, and Aaron Copeland, who is in a lot of people's minds, sort of a person who created the really distinctly American sounding mm-hmm. music, of course, studied in France with Nadia Boulanger um, mm-hmm. and was writing in a way that was very influenced by you know, French neoclassicism and Stravinsky. And you know, so you, you couldn't really have that American sound without <laughs> Stravinsky, yeah, which um, who lived in LA, so you know, maybe, he, maybe he was <laughs> writing American music. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, everything is um, very connected, <laughs> and even the like the ideas of transcendentalism, um, New England transcendentalism are really derivative of German and uh, English literary and uh, philosophical ideas. So um, there's a lot of connection, and it just depends on kind of what people want to play up or how they want to think about things, um, mm-hmm. as, as and and how they present them. Um, I mean, which is not to say certainly that there weren't, there's, there certainly are influences from American culture or from American cultures, because one of the things about this, of course, is there's no one, there's no one thing that's American, everything else that happens to be here isn't. There are lots of different, different possible definitions. So that was, that was the thing I had to be very careful about was to say, I'm not talking about uh, an exclusive or a, a or a, a you know a, a thing that omits a lot of other stuff. I'm just talking about how did these people talk about this? What did they say? Con- so, you know, what did they say constituted it? Um, so just because you know there are the pilgrims and the Indians who get together and have Thanksgiving dinner uh, in one place in New England, that doesn't mean that there weren't lots of other people doing other things in America at the same yeah. time. Yeah, know? very true. Um, <laughs> but only one of those gets used as a trope to, you know, for a long time gets used as a way to describe, like, this is a constitutional founding act of, mm-hmm. of American culture and society, and we, we celebrate it with a holiday where we eat a lot. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, Um I don't know it's 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 fascinating. I, I I'd like to go back to that um, to some of that research um, at some point and and work on it some more because the way that people think and talk about this kind of stuff has changed kind of amazingly um, since I finished that work in the like in 1999 was when I finished my dissertation mm-hmm. and the world the way that people think and talk about this has changed so much that I really need to go back and add <laughs> a bunch yeah. of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be really contextualized. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If I ever ever can get ahead of you know, making the spring schedule or um, you know, <laughs> filling out paperwork. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, that, that could be the next book. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That, that's what it should have been, right? You were supposed to like redo your dissertation for your for your first book, but I was dumb. I did something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, still very interesting, though, and yeah. something that I, I think we'll probably be able to touch on a little bit later, uh, time permitting. I mean, we've mentioned, you know, New England a, a few times here, which is where, where the Iveses are are from. Um, I'm wondering if you could give us kind of like a brief, um, like primer background, just a little bit before we get into George Ives's mm-hmm. uh, biography. What was kind of the musical culture up, you know, in New England, you know, in, in the early to mid 1850s, kind of when when things were brewing here for for George and then Charles Ives? Sure. Um, so. I mean, I don't think you, you can't really talk about a single musical culture. It's different in different places. So a place mm-hmm. like Boston is going to be different from Danbury. Um, right. So Danbury was a small-ish city, um, so sort of right on the cusp of between a, a big town and a small city. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's in southern New York near the I mean, excuse me, southern Connecticut near the New York uh, border, and it was it was uh, a center for the hatting industry. Um, which is kind of interesting, um, and had um, 
uh, a kind of a mixed population of sort of the um, immigrants who worked in, in the hatting industry um, and then the sort of founding families, which were all sort of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and mm-hmm. smaller Catholic populations. So it, it, it wasn't the, it sort of had this idea kind of, um, I, the as I was sort of presented it as this tiny New England town that was sort of frozen in time, but it wasn't really quite. Um, but it, it did have, so there were kind of two um, concurrent musical traditions. On the one hand, there's sort of um, the vernacular tradition. So this is um, bands and um, the kinds of you know, medicine shows and traveling performers that would come through and fiddle tunes and um, uh, camp meetings were a big mm-hmm. thing. So religious music, um, sort of you know, outdoor kind of rough and ready um, yeah. singing. Um, and then there's the more genteel kind of indoor um, classically associated tradition, which was more of a, thought of as more of a feminine kind of a sphere. Um, so a little bit more proper and genteel. Um, and both of those are going to some extent um, during um, George Ives' boyhood and then into Charles's. Um, so bands don't really, the Danbury itself doesn't get a band um, until really after the Civil War. Um, and then and George Ives is involved, not from the very beginning, but but from about, um, well, from around the time that Charles was born, so the, the 70s, mid-70s, he started to be more and more involved in band culture. Um, but there were things like you know, they, would, they would do um, kind of musical shows with, with songs and, and, and comedy, or they would do, um, like there was the, the Strawberry Festival, which <laughs> at which the band would play. Or, mm-hmm. um, so um, it's not, it certainly isn't the same kind of thing as, you know, a, a string quartet concert series or, a, or the kind of thing that, um, that Ives would be able to, or that Charles Ives would be able to have access to um, in New Haven or in New York a, a little bit later. But mm-hmm. it was, there was a fair amount of music going on uh, and it was sort of, um, divided among sort of more rough and ready outdoor kind of music, um, and then the then the more um, cultured or uh, elite or um, European uh, kind of trained classical music, um, which was seen as an, an import, right? It was a thing that was a little bit held in suspicion. Um, oh, and the, the interesting thing about George Ives is that he he had sort of his foot in both worlds. He had mm-hmm. training. Uh, he had had gone to New York and had training um, lessons from this guy called Charles Fipple. Um and so he had he didn't do like the real thing. If you're going to be a fully um, you know, documented. Um, you know, a uh, composer or a musician, you had to go to Europe, you had to go to Germany mm-hmm. and get training. But mm-hmm. um, so so George did kind of the, the next best thing. He went to New York, lived there for a few years, got this, yeah, like you know, had these hand lessons. Kind of, yeah. yeah, so it's, it's <laughs> yeah. one step removed. Uh, mm-hmm. And came back and was, so he was able to, you know, to arrange songs for a show uh, or to able to, uh, you know, to to write arrangements for his band or whatever, mm-hmm. um, and also able to you know p- perform in you know p- cornet solos and, and so mm-hmm. kind of has the oral tradition and the, the written tradition. Um, he apparently could play um, piano, violin, flute, uh, and cornet, and, and had perfect pitch and was you know was no kind of a natural musician, yeah. um, but never like he he went to New York but didn't stay. Like he didn't, mm-hmm. didn't, for whatever reason, didn't break in, like live in that tr- tradition where it could have been more of a, either more of a vernacular or more of a serious musician. But for whatever reason, he came back home and was sort of the, the man about town um, mm-hmm. in terms of music um, for, for, much of, for much of his life. Um, although he, his family, the Ives family was very prominent in business. Mm-hmm. Um, they they ran a hardware store. They ran a bank. They had a lumber yard. They had you know, all this stuff, and so he was sort of pulled into that, uh, especially mm-hmm. to to support his family. But he was never quite 
Like he wasn't really a partner. He was like, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. the family owned the hardware store. He worked at the counter, mm-hmm. um, and yeah. and so it was this kind of the fact that he was a musician made him never be quite the businessman that probably his family really wanted him to be. Yeah. And so the, and so in a lot of biographers of Charles Ives have seen that as being a a kind of a source of ambivalence for Ives, that he was a little suspicious of the idea of music as a career because his, his father had had a hard time with it. And that's why he did insurance to not go into the musician life full, full mm, hard-handed. Maybe. Well, <laughs> it's hard to know for sure. That's certainly one of the ideas that a lot of people have, have put forward. And I, mm-hmm. I think that certainly um, influenced it. But... Mm-hmm. You know, who knows for you know, that there was only one reason or whether you know, yeah, true. what it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So after studying in New York and and becoming the music man in uh, Danbury, Connecticut, uh, what was kind of his George's sorry George's path to becoming this more recognized band leader, uh, especially through the eighteen sixties and then post. Yeah, so the, I think the sixties is before this. So, but mm-hmm. so he was, um, he had studied, uh, had done some study with football uh, in New York. Um, when he started when he was fifteen, mm-hmm. and uh, he was born in eighteen forty-five. So that's right around right around eighteen sixty that okay. he's, um, and then the Civil War starts up, mm-hmm. and he ended up um, enlisting. Um, and um, it was suggested that he should recruit a band because he was known as a, as a musician by this point. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he uh, recruited members of a band that was associated with the first Connecticut volunteer artillery or the, the Connecticut heavies, they were called. Mm-hmm. And um, he, he was um, mustered in as a principal musician, uh, in, which was a equivalent of a second lieutenant um, and um, so he actually he had a servant. Yeah, you know, he made about eighty six dollars a week. I mean, excuse me, a month, which was which was a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. Wow. And was the leader of this band. And so it, at first it seemed, um, I think, probably pretty glamorous, and the you know, family was proud of him for doing this. But the the life of a, a band member, um, they played for a lot of kind of. Um, mundane things they played for punishments they were drafted mm-hmm. as uh stretcher bearers when they were playing and um it it wasn't quite what he thought it was going to be mm-hmm. and so eventually he re- he requested um and this is really kind of mysterious we don't know exactly what, what went on but he requested to be taken to be removed from the band and he wanted to be he just wanted to be a regular soldier Hmm. Uh, and at the same time, he he apparently trashed his his cornet, he destroyed his instrument, oh. um, and that wasn't that was a, an offense. So he was actually court-martialed for that, and um, had and, and was docked a month's pay. Um, hmm. And then shortly after that, he slipped on the ice and hurt his back, and so that was kind of the end of his his career. And that that, that whole slipped on the ice in quotation marks. I <laughs> don't know. Um, <laughs> that, that it certainly seemed like it could be. Um, yeah. yeah. But um, he was apparently legitimately ill. He was like, mm-hmm. or hurt. He was home for months um, mm-hmm. and laid up. Um, mm-hmm. And then by that point, the war was pretty much over. Um, so he had, you know, when you read biographies of, of Charles Ives or you see how Ives talks about him, you know, none of that is ever mentioned. Yeah, it's yeah. always like his father had the youngest band leader in the Civil uh, in the Union Army in the Civil War, which in fact he was. Um, but the the sort of um, dark side of it didn't come out. So that's yeah. you know it's an interesting thing about about biography and what people choose to remember and how, how they choose to idealize things. Um, yeah, so he, so he had this, um, and he seems to have avoided band stuff for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, like when he got back to Danbury, he um, he eventually went back to New York and took more lessons and then eventually came back. And he, so he was participating in music, but he was like playing cornet solos in concerts that other people were putting on, or he was uh, organizing some sort of variety show type things. And it wasn't for several years that he finally started participating in uh, uh, the activities of the band and eventually had the, the Ives 
the Ives Cornet Band, they were called. Um, yeah. And so that was, so really, it was, so if he got back in 65 and was um, kind of bopping around New York until about 68 or, or 69, it wasn't really until the early 70s that, um, so around the time that Charles was born, that in 74, that he was really starting to be more and more, you know, kind of involved in band music. Gotcha. Um, and then, then that was pretty much the, he had this dual life after that. On the one side, he was doing all, all these musical things. And on the other side, he was, um, you know, he was working at the, in the Ives family business in various, um, in various capacities. Gotcha. A true yeah. freelancer, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I mean, that was really what there was in Denver. You, there, I, and, unless you were a church organist, um, and even that was probably not enough really to have, you know, mm. a, a full career. You would have had to do like most musicians. So you, you teach and you play and you, um, you know, do whatever kind of gigs come along and that mm. would be enough. Yeah. Is there much information on that uh, Ives Cornet band or is that kind of just uh, uh, sparsely mentioned and that we know it was kind of a thing? Yeah, well, um, I mean, there, there is mention of it in the newspaper in Denver. It's a nice thing about a smallish town. You have you know, fairly detailed local coverage. So we know, you know that they played in various, you know, various places, various times. We know some of the people who were in the band. We know, um, you know some of the repertoire that they played. Mm -hmm. um, I, haven't, I haven't looked at that stuff really carefully, but um, it, it definitely, some records of it exist. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. So one of the, so at least supposedly one of the first um, pieces that I've wrote, the holiday quit step, was for that band, hmm. and they they gave the premiere when he was eleven or twelve, maybe I don't know, um, and he was apparently too shy to to actually. Um, watch so he was around the back of the house like <laughs> playing handball against the side of the house while the band marched by playing his piece nice. at least that's the, that's the story at least <laughs> that's kind of cute yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, uh, George's musical life and his life with the band and outside of music all was, I'm sure, and the way it sounds, very influential on Charles's life. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you maybe talk to that a little bit on maybe their relationship and how uh, George had this influence? Because even in my limited research of Charles Ives, you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. that... You could be on a website or reading a book for Charles Ives and there is, you know, a decent preface or introduction material talking about George sure. kind of as that that early introduction phase. So can you talk to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, um, definitely. It was a very intense father son relationship and there was a lot of musical influence Um George was apparently really interested in sort of sounds and like musical sounds, but all sound like the sound of, of a thunderstorm or the sound of the bells, um, like ringing in the distance. And um, he would supposedly try to like figure out how you could play a bell sound on the piano, which of course the overtones are all wrong for that. So he was <laughs> trying to, to um, like to really capture um, the the sounds of things. And supposedly he made a, a a machine where he stretched strings on a laundry press so he could get smaller than uh, smaller than half step intervals. So he was like in, in the, really interested in music from a more kind of speculative um, viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And um, now this is all stories that Charles told. So we don't know what was you know kind of exaggerated in what was real but yeah. it, it seems like there was there's some basis to it and 
and um, so clearly Charles Ives had a, a, an amazing um, kind of um, sound world and sound experience. So he also had perfect pitch and had um, mm. and was able to remember sound like really specific, not just sound, but like the the difference between. Uh, you know, sounds heard at a distance as opposed to close up. And um, he tried, like, he played around with those ideas in his music. So, like, what the difference between a loud sound um, mm -hmm. that's far away, so it sounds soft to you, but it started as a loud sound, or yeah. the sound's moving in space and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, um, like I camera manipulation as yeah. opposed to just, like, chords and notes exactly. on the page. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, that like, the, the unanswered question where he specifies that there are three separate groups that are playing, and they're playing, to some extent, unrelated to one another. Um, that sort of experimentation with not, not just sound, but sound placement and sound groups, um, which is something that I was really influential in, that, that seems to have come. Uh, from his father's approach to mm -hmm. to music, and there's the famous um, uh, story of George deciding to see what it would sound like if um, two bands were would play different pieces and cross, um, mm -hmm. and like, trying to listen to what that that combined sound was that mm -hmm. um, Charles Ives sort of um, simulates in the Putnam's Camp movement of, of, of three places in New England, mm -hmm. um, where he has two different ensembles at different tempi uh, yeah. um, playing kind of two different um, kind of marching patterns, basically. So it's, it's sort of an evocation of this idea of the two bands at once, mm -hmm. um, which, which he always put back to his, to, to his father. Um, now, whether this was a serious thing or whether it was just, you know, it would be kind of a, a, a joke um, is, is a question. Like Charles seemed to, to take a lot of serious ideas out of the stuff that his father may have done just sort of fooling around. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know for sure uh, exactly what, you know, George didn't write any music down particularly. We have some, um, we have one book of his exercises that he did when he was uh, a student um, sort of counterpoint exercises, so we know that he had that that kind of formal training. But um, like you know, Georgia never like here's my quarter tone experiment. Um, yeah. Here's how I did it, kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. there's no lab report. But the, that con that I sort of musical like music all the time environment and mm -hmm. the idea that any sound could be associated with music. I think that's the thing that he got the the most from his dad. And mm -hmm. then I think the other thing that he got from his dad was a love of all of the different kinds of music. So the, the vernacular stuff, the, what he called the band stuff, um, mm -hmm. just as much, at, or, and the camp meetings, his father would apparently lead the singing at camp meetings, he would play uh, the whatever hymn on the cornet. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had a slide so he could, he could uh, manipulate the pitch. So if the, uh, if the congregation was rising in pitch, he would just mm -hmm. sort of modulate his horn <laughs> up as he went. Um, to, to stay with them because that sort of feeling of elation and and you know, um, the communal sense that it was the participation in the music that was important. It wasn't that we must stay exactly on pitch. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, th I think that's a really important idea that I got out of his boyhood that he associated with his father that was really important in his music. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what about, what do you feel about, uh, I found a, a quote that I included in our document here um, talking about kind of Ives's embracing of amateurism in mm -hmm. his music. Uh, I was able to pull a quote from the, the Hazen's book, The Music Men, uh, regarding Charles Ives's piece, The Fourth of July, or uh, a singular movement. I'm not mm -hmm. exactly familiar with the piece itself, but how his copyist was concerned with some of the wrong notes and some of the, the not nicety written within the music and Ives wanted it to sound like a band and said to play everything or yeah, all the wrong everything. notes are right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mr. Yeah. Price. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think there are several things going on there. I, I think Ives is really interested in um, creating things the way he remembered them. Uh, and and create and keep and making the sound be really evocative of actual sonic experience, and maybe not any one, but more, sort of a, a 
you know how it is when you sort of remember things in the past and you kind of glom them all together and there's mm. no not one specific thing but lots of lots of experiences of hearing bands perform um you know and and the fourth of july was a fairly heavy drinking holiday um uh, back in ives this time mm -hmm. uh so the, these band guys may have been hitting the beer for a good while mm -hmm. before they're playing for the parade yeah. um and you know so I, I can't imagine that it was all perfect. And so rather than clean it up and make it nice, he wants to, to make it be really like he remembered it. Mm -hmm. um, and that that was a more interesting way of treating, the, and of treating the music and of coming up with something that's not just the same old march, right? Yeah. Um, so this idea of um, sort of creating music that would be uh, kind of breaking the rules, but was more like what actually might have happened or maybe mm -hmm. an exaggerated form of what might have happened um, mm -hmm. is, is something that he was really interested in. Whether it was in a more, um, a kind of a comic sense, like in Country Band March, where he's clearly making fun of the kinds of mistakes that bands would make, you know, mm -hmm. having people just enter you know, half a measure off or in, in <laughs> yeah. the wrong time signature, or they put the wrong crook in their horns or in, they're playing in the wrong key or mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is, or whether it's more the sense of the kind of communal exaltation that causes people to you know, to, to sing in a, in a manner that wouldn't be considered pretty, but that's that's very, you know, that's the mark of their their intensity, um, yeah. their musical experience. And he was more more interested in that. And he talked about, uh, it's better to have some yellers than it, you know, than it is to have you know, people who sing properly. Yeah. Um, that um, there's this famous quote about this um, guy who was a stonemason, Mason Bell, who apparently would, would sing very enthusiastically, but pretty horribly. Um, and so some, somebody asked him how, I think it was somebody asked George how he could, how he could stand here and sing. He said, well, no, don't, don't listen to his voice, listen to the music, um, yeah. which is you know, what he considered to be this kind of ecstasy or experience or... Um, um, I guess you could call it authenticity, although that term gets used in so many different ways that I don't mm -hmm. totally want to use it. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Um, so that kind of intense, emotional, spiritual, musical experience is I think what he associated with this sort of band culture, um, mm -hmm. that, that it was a thing that people really cared about and that they did it in a way that was sort of rough and ready, but that was sort of the charm of it. Yeah. And so the thing that's really interesting about, about Charles Ives is that he wants to take that kind of sound, those kinds of sounds, and use them as the basis for pieces of concert music, uh, mm -hmm. pieces of classical music that take those ideas and abstract them, or that that, that um, use them to create some kind of a musical landscape or whatever it is that he's doing. Yeah, yeah. it's really interesting that he he wanted to recreate what he remembered hearing from those performances and by writing in all those, if we want to call them errors or amateur kind of mistakes, as opposed to writing a clean piece of music and then just going to hear an amateur performance of it and probably hearing those mistakes yeah. already anyway. <laughs> well, that's always the thing, right? You know, you hear, hear um, a group of people who make one of these, you know, do one of these performances where there are just insane things going on. And, uh, and you think if you had to write that down, it would be impossible. Like if you tried <laughs> to play that exactly that mm -hmm. it would be, um, it's like that, that, um, performance of the national anthem that that was trending like crazy on, on social media for a right. while the person mm -hmm. who sang it so off key yeah, yeah um yeah. like to uh, a transcription of that looks like musical gibberish yeah um, right. i but, always love those those like fail videos i love when yeah. jazz musicians usually go in and then like put like new like yeah, a yeah, to yeah. harmonies <laughs> to it and they're able to make it work and it's like okay <laughs> So I mean, in a sense, that's the same in the same spirit as what I was doing. Um, although I think he's doing it from a, a place of um, nostalgia, from a place of, of serious musical um, experimentation, and also from nostalgia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I would I would love to hear Ives's harmonization of, the, of, yeah. the, of that performance. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a that's a really good point that you bring up circling back a little bit about like the participation aspect of the mm -hmm. music was was what was really important and i mean we see that now i mean the brass bands that we you know talk about on this show you know with other guests and that that chris runs you know it's it, back then it was more about like people just wanted to be involved in mm -hmm. that 
that act of making music, which I think is great. And I mean, you see it all the time, even today with community bands, like just the 4th of July, I was back home playing with a community band in South Central Pennsylvania. And in every single little town, there was a community band concert on the 4th of July. And it's just that amateur, you know, in the true sense of the word, you know, for <laughs> the love of doing it, it was around then and it's still around now. So I think that's yeah. a really great thing. And I mean, yeah. getting, getting back to the question about the musical um, atmosphere in New England and that the, the 1870s, and 80s were the kind of the pinnacle of town band culture mm -hmm. um, because there had, there were so many instruments that were kind of washing around after the Civil War. There was there was lots of band activity. Like every town had a band. Like mm -hmm. Danbury had a band. Had a band. West Reading, just maybe two miles away, had a band. Mm -hmm. You know, and they would they would get together and have contests and they would have parades. They would march. And it was it was really a source of civic pride. And mm -hmm. um, just the you know, thousands, tens of thousands of, of little town bands. And, and that's actually another thing that's important for Charles Ives' music. They were not regulation that you must have exactly this many of these kinds of instruments. Uh, kind of, you know, it was not the Sousa band that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, this was whatever people had. Um, so, and, and so, you know, um, one of the things, one of the questions that you had on the, on the document was, you know, did Ives write any band music? Yeah, uh, it depends on what you mean by band music. If you mean like a um, written for collegiate wind symphony band piece with exactly the instrumentation that you would want to have in grade one music, no, he did not. Um, but he wrote a lot of pieces that are sort of for mixed um, instrumentation, sort of theater orchestra uh, uh, instrumentation, mm -hmm. which um maybe you know, are really flexible you might, might use a violin you might use a saxophone you might use this um the, i think that is really reflective of this sort of um rough and ready participatory whatever you have you play the song with kind of um mm -hmm. tradition that he grew up around mm -hmm. uh, and that he, that he was interested in um and it's you interesting have... that he, he takes that and makes it into classical chamber music mm -hmm. yeah. You had mentioned that he wrote for his dad's band, though, also. So he had a few brass band pieces under his under his wing, too, right? Yeah. So I mean, he wrote he wrote some marches um, that we don't have. I don't think we have like an actual band orchestration uh, or uh, instrumentation of any of them. Mm -hmm. Although I have never looked at the holiday quick step materials. Like a lot of them get. Um, get subsumed into other pieces. So mm -hmm. like there's a, a song called Son of a Gambolier, which is basically a, a march. Mm -hmm. um, there, um, there is, there are some pieces that, that are, uh, that he wrote or that survive as, as piano pieces, or keyboard pieces mm -hmm. that are clearly marches that could be, you know, could be easily scored for band, but we yeah. don't have, don't have like mature, um, pieces that are actually sworn for wind band specifically mm -hmm. it's interesting that you know the what you're saying the, the materials the manuscripts and stuff you know we're not sure if they exist you know orchestrated out for band but later you know a number of his compositions have been orchestrated for more of that collegiate yeah you know, with variations on america i remember playing that at a band festival in high school yeah um someone took the the alcott's movement from the second piano mm -hmm. sonata put that mm -hmm. for band which i played multiple Beautiful. times which is yeah. really neat yeah that's, that's a nice. great piece of especially when you get when you get the whole low brass section going at the end where you know it's really grand and you hit the low yeah. end of the piano really hard i yeah, will say <laughs> as as a side note taking that class with you a few years ago dr owens i think that discovery was finding the alcott's was kind of like one of the biggest like wow moments from that mm -hmm. class and, and yeah. hearing that music for the first time i had never heard the piano or the the band arrangement of that piece it's fantastic yeah um yeah, it is absolutely um I, I like i really like both of those actually yeah um the 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 band uh, arrangement of variations of America I have a serious beef with, um, which is the the, the, the trumpet solo. Yeah, it, yeah. it should be, it should be it, a tuba it, solo. It, well, it should be, yeah. yeah and yeah. and in fact, I just describes it as the brass band march in the in the pedal solo. Hmm. So it should it should be like the whole like that should be the whole low brass section together, or at least in your phone solo. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> I agree. But yeah. it's it's the um, 
you know, it's it's in the pedals. It's, it is not a, this kind of pretty little trumpet part. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe some of our listeners aren't familiar. I know, at least for me, before taking your class as a band person, my exposure to Charles Ives mm-hmm. was maybe exclusively only variations on America. Mm-hmm. And then finding out that it was actually based on an orchestration by William Schumann. I was like, oh, it's actually an orchestra piece. And then finding out, <laughs> oh, it's actually an organ solo piece. And, <laughs> yeah. and kind of like keep on finding these steps. I don't want to say steps back, because that makes it sound like it's <laughs> it's it's getting uh, further away from the prime awesome version of the band mm. version. But <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, very, very surprising. And maybe some people will be surprised to learn that Variations on America was an organ solo. It was. <laughs> and there's some really there's some really cool letters between Ives and the organist E. Power Biggs about that piece and um, talking about how um, it was it was like that it was more fun to play than playing baseball or almost more fun to play than playing baseball. Like it really placed up the sort of athletic um, side of the, of the performance and how the, the boys in the audience would get really excited at the pedal solo and they would mm-hmm. like march up and down the aisle and all of this. Yeah. Um, I'm sure this is sort of half imagined, half remembered stuff, but the, the way that he, that he describes it is very much in this sort of participatory fun um, kind of um, you know, acting out, sort of, um, and and not a proper organ solo. Yeah. Um, oh, I remember when he premiered it at the the church that he uh, his father asked him to remove right the the dissonant uh, interlude variations. Yeah, well, he, he for sure he he took, uh, one place I says his dad didn't want him to play the polonaise version, the minor key version mm-hmm. or variation because he didn't think the minor key fit somehow. Um, <laughs> Whether the, the the polytonal parts don't know exactly what the, the provenance of those is, they might be a little later. Um, mm. So, yeah, I, I I'm not certain that that's what his dad was talking gotcha, about. Gotcha. But gotcha, it, gotcha. yeah, that, that's that's great uh, piece of music. Yeah, it is for sure. This is a very random specific question about that. Let me turn myself up here again. Uh, do you know if the variations of america on america if that was ever like produced as like a piano roll or like anything for like a player organ because i was just at the reason i ask is because i was just at knobles which is like a family-run amusement park in pennsylvania over father's day and it was hilarious because on the day we were there there must have been like a carousel organ like convention or like showcase or something so they had all these like carousel organs there and now we're talking about this variations on America thing. I'm like, this would sound awesome on it a carousel would. organ. <laughs> um, not to my knowledge, yeah. it was. It was. Um, or I've tried to have it published. Um, what when you know, he wrote it when he was like 16 or so, mm-hmm. and they were they were trying to get it published, but it, it wasn't very well a well known piece. Yeah. So I doubt it. Um, but that would be a very very cool thing. Yeah, get <laughs> all sure. that get all that percussion yeah. that comes on yeah. on a big carousel <laughs> organ. That'd be that'd be awesome. Anyway, here if anyone out there is involved with carousel organs or like organ grinder stuff, get on it because it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the interludes, I don't know that might scare the kids on the horses on the thing when it starts doing the you know, okay. bitonality and stuff. <laughs> Got to spook them somehow. Yeah, can't, it can't be all carnivals funny are games. supposed to be a little bit scary though. I mean, yeah. that's <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. When you were doing the the book, were you able to find any specific correspondence between Charles and his father that maybe gave any unique insight into their relationship or specifically influence on the music, Charles's music? Yeah, there's there's a, a fair amount of correspondence um, between him and his father. Um, his father died when he was a freshman in college. Um, he had a stroke when he was 57 and died, um, and which was a really traumatic event, uh, as mm-hmm. you can imagine. Um, and so there's a whole kind of school of 
sort of Ives um, biography that sort of championed by um, Stuart Fader, who was a, uh, a psychologist um, and uh, wrote two biographies of Ives, um, talking about the how basically Ives' this whole creative um, process or, or um, like his, his whole creativity was bound up in this unresolved relationship with his father. Like he was mm-hmm. trying to write the music that his father had never been able to write. Um, and um, it's it's really interesting. I think it maybe goes further than I would. Um, mm-hmm. you know, but it's it's a very provocative um, way of thinking about I, Ives and and what he said his influences were and how how he conceived of like the inspiration that he got. And a lot of that um, of that viewpoint comes from letters that that Charles wrote during his freshman year home to to George. Um, and so there was a, seemed to be a little bit of a strain in between them, the, the kind of differentiation process that was going on, and you're moving away, and he wants to be his own person, and George wants to control things, and uh, then all of a sudden he dies. Um, and clearly they're very close musically, um, but it it doesn't come out. Uh, it's just it's like kind of like all in you know, aside. You know, they, mm-hmm. they they talk about music in a very familiar way. Um, Charles describes how he is able, to, like he's gotten a job uh, as a, as an organist. So he worked. Ch- Charles Ives worked as an organist from the time he was about fourteen years old, mm-hmm. um, uh, professionally uh, played church organ and d- did that all through college to to help support um, himself. Mm-hmm. And so he. Um, he, he was writing to George about you know, the kind the kinds of hymns he had to play and the way he had to play them and how this church they played things much faster than he was used to or mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so you can tell that they have this really deep kind of musical connection but it's sort of just assumed and in the background mm-hmm. and then um, and the other kind of stuff is is more kind of what the letters are about or yeah. that or, or they're all, a lot of them are like I need a hat and I need you to send this for my dorm room and I, yeah. <laughs> it was all dumb stuff like you know Charles didn't want to come home for the holiday he wanted to stay at school or he you know he wanted to do something one way and his dad wanted to do it the other way it, it wasn't like you know I hate you and I never want to see you again <laughs> kind of yeah. arguing mm-hmm. um gotcha gotcha but yeah so that that his father dying definitely made a made a huge um, impact on him. And so later um, in his life, you know, Charles always put his father as the most important influence musically for him. Like everything I learned, I really learned from my father. Mm-hmm. Um, and he downplayed other things that were clearly uh, also influential on him, like mm-hmm. his teacher at Yale, Horatio Parker. Um, later in Ives' career, he pretty much um, either said that Park, you know, Parker had been well-intentioned but kind of hard-boiled and uh, conservative and rigid, uh, or he just didn't talk about it much at all. Um, said that you know, he really got everything from his dad. But if you look at what I've actually learned, the progression that he makes in college and shortly after, it's clear that Parker had a, a pretty huge influence on him. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can you can see how the kind of the way that his dad had sort of left this this unfinished legacy for him, it would be easy for him to idealize him uh, and yeah. sort of blow up his role in a way that um, maybe the, the documentary evidence doesn't completely support. Mm, it's interesting think- how, yeah, how that kind of connects all the different themes that we've been talking about in the last hour in terms of uh, the influence of nostalgia, mm-hmm. the influence of selective biography writing <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing, and then uh, yeah, just George's influence in general. Do you think how when I mentioned at the very beginning how a lot of Charles's biographies and websites has that large George chunk mm-hmm. at the beginning? Do you think that form of biography then is maybe a little unwarranted? I know you're just mentioning Horatio Parker. Um, well, I think to, to what extent do you think that maybe uh george's involvement is maybe a little bit overblown if that's the right way of wording it. I, I think that's the way that charles presented it um so he he talked about george being really important and mm-hmm. talked about his influence and how and so clearly that's something that we have to pay attention to um mm-hmm. but then we can also you know ask questions about well, what can you know? What do we see in the surviving materials? What do we see in, in the in, you know in the documents? And um, what 
what else can we find that's you know uh, that may have been important and maybe in ways that I just didn't even realize or in mm. ways that you know your your perspective on how things happen to you changes over time and your memory changes. Um, I was also depending on when we're talking about was to some extent playing to different audiences. So when he was working in the um, in the, the late 20s and the 30s um, and 40s with people like Henry Cowell and uh, Lou Harrison and Nicholas Lenimsky, uh, who were really musically modernist. You know, they, they wanted the aggressive, dissonant eyes. Um, Horatio Parker, who was this very conservative, um, mainstream kind of uh, figure, wasn't really the sort of teacher that I ought to have. <laughs> so, um, you know, he, he wants to talk about how his father was so important and they want, want Ives not to have, um, to be kind of coming out of the genteel Ivy League uh, European musical tradition. So that was, that was an easy kind of way of telling the story. And the Henry and Henry Cowell and his wife, Sidney, were, were Ives' first biographers. Mm-hmm. So they, they played up the stuff that they thought was was important, yeah. uh, which was the stuff that you know was the music that, that they were interested in. And so this yeah. this whole idea of Ives as as really being really important as a pioneering figure of modernism, you know, like who who did all this dissonant stuff before Schoenberg and before Stravinsky, um, and the, this idea that Ives was dissonant early that, that was what was important, um, kind of comes out of this of that context, the context of Ives sort of interacting with those composers at that later time um, who were interested in that sort of music. So that was the side of his composition that that got played up. Um, do, you, and, do you disagree with those first kind of images of who Ives was? Um, I think it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, I, I think that the the idea of what was important in what he did got really simplified by put, running it through this filter of we must look at things in terms of distance and in terms of early distance. Um, there are a lot of things that I've did that are really unusual, um, really groundbreaking that have not much to do with that. Um, and there there are things that I've did that were very conservative. I mean, late in his career, he could still write a nice, pretty piece in C major. Um, and and did sometimes, but um, he did do some really interesting experiments very early in his career with um, polytonality and dissonance. And um, I don't think it's important who did what first, um, mm. because even if Ives had done that, you know, written those things in the 1890s, no one heard them, or very few people heard them. So it's not mm. as if we. Schoenberg was actually lurking in his closet listening to what, what Ives did and then went home and, and said, oh, I made this up. Um, yeah. <laughs> so in a sense, it's kind of a silly argument. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but I do think that the like what Ives did is a lot more, um, it, it stretches beyond the sort of cartoon image of his music as a bunch of quotations with wrong notes in them. Uh, or, um, you know, this, this music that's just designed to sound harsh. Um, mm. I mean, there are certain, the, the 4th of July is a good example. That piece, parts of it sound really harsh because mm. he's um, sort of um, creating an explosion of, you know, like, all the fireworks going off at once. Um, yeah. So that's a pretty loud, clangorous, bangorous kind of a sound. But, um, you know, a piece like The Pond, which is um, a sort of remembrance of his father, um, is a very subdued, quiet, beautiful piece, or a piece like Mists, or a piece like um, um, the first movement of the um, first string quartet, or um, there, there are tons of pieces that are very conventional, in, or in a lot of ways are conventional, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and that's fine with him too. You know, he said that it was, it was kind of like what clothes you wore depend on what the weather was. You know, someday you feel like having tonality and someday you don't <laughs> feel like you need it. Um, so you know, to my mind, that's what's more interesting about him. Mm-hmm. And it's not the, that there's this one progression that he followed and he became a dissonant composer and, and remained that way. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one part of the story, but that's not the only part. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, again, being the uh, selective information and in how that can uh, 
kind of put blinders and show us what we want to see where there's a, a much bigger picture to be had for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm not trying to say in, in any of these cases that people are lying or that people are are <laughs> twisting the truth, yeah. or yeah, or that there's any, there's, there's any disingenuousness. I think it's more um, you're coming out of a context where you're looking at something, and there's only so much that you can focus on or that you need to focus on, and that's what gets told. So mm-hmm. there was this this um, kind of image of Ives around the mid 1970s. So that was right around the centennial of his birth, and it was right around the bicentennial of the, the United States, you know, in '76. And there were there were there was an explosion of recording and performance of Ives, and it was very much Ives the American figure, like Ives the quintessential American composer, mm-hmm. and a lot of this um, exaggerated sense of you know, what an American composer was and what his music would be, you know. Um, um, him getting compa- compared to Grandma Moses, the sort of primitivist uh, American painter, um, mm. which is a really silly thing to, to say. I mean, there's very little. You know, I've definitely had university training in music. <laughs> he was not. He was not a completely untutored primitivist composer in, in mm. any way. Um, but this idea that you can't have a Euro- European antecedents and that you have to be kind of sprung from the soil and um, that, that sort of series of tropes that I wrote about my dissertation sort of get amplified humongously uh, in, in that sort of vision of Ives. Yeah. Um, and sort of the idea of uh, Americana was so important at that point in mm-hmm. American society anyway. Um, mm-hmm. And then, then you know, the image of Ives changes in the, in the 80s, there's sort of a different Ives, and, and, and now there, there's even a, a different one. So um, it's interesting to see how you, know, you can do this with any figure, uh, at, like you know, um, any musician or any artist of any sort. You can see how their how their reception is depends on when you're talking about and kind of what's going on yeah, at the know. time. a suggestion for our listeners of if they want to get into Ives musically, maybe sure. Well, the, the di- Marine, different ideas. Yeah. Yeah. The Marine Band did a great recording uh, CD of Ives' music uh, a number of years ago. So that's that's definitely um, if you're looking for band performances of Ives' music, that's a good place to start. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it depends on what you what you like. Like the the songs are a, a, a really nice, um, diverse um, collection. So just you know, if it just go on to whatever your stream music source of choice is, and mm-hmm. um, just pull up a, a, an album of Ives songs, and you'll find something on there that, that interests you. There are German songs, there are French songs, there are mm-hmm. songs in Italian. Gotcha. Um, but then there, yeah, then there are also all these other ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some that are like settings of, of English romantic poets that are very proper um, and really kind of old fashioned. But then there are some that are you know, crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, so. Um, you know, something like uh, General William Booth enters into heaven. That's an, another really good um, and fairly well-known Ives song. It was it was in the uh, Norton uh, Burkholder route um, mm-hmm. anthology you know, for yeah. a long time, but maybe mm-hmm. still is. Um, and it actually has kind of a simulated band in it. So that's another another good band um, nice. uh, piece, band associated piece. In mm-hmm. fact, there was there was an arrangement I think for band of that piece that. Um, that John Becker did. Um, I don't know if that still exists. Um, I was actually, so Becker was this um, this modernist composer who lived in the Midwest and near Chicago, um, was uh, never really quite was able to support himself on writing the kind of music that he wanted to write. Um, Mm. And so I was, 
gave him a lot of money basically to mm. sort of keep him going. Um, and so one of the things that I, I'm pretty sure that he um, supported Becker by doing was to, to make this arrangement of the of General Booth. Um, I can't remember if it was for orchestra or if it was for band. I think it was for band. It, mm -hmm. it would be easy to find out. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll look into it for sure. That yeah. sounds interesting. Uh, yeah. there, there are letters in the correspondence book that mention it. So okay. great. Um, and if if you're if you're kind of interested in Ives and band, the 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 person who's done a lot of work on that is Jonathan Elkis, um, uh, who's a, a scholar of both. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's you know, if you're looking for sort of Ives in the band world and the connections. That he's he's the guy, um, awesome. and then I would say you know, the do if you if you're just kind of interested in you know hearing eyes and you have it much the songs in one place and then the first piano sonata is another that, that's the piece that got me hooked so mm -hmm. um, maybe it, it has some allure for other people as well. Yeah, where does the Concord Sonata fit into people's uh, list of must listen to Ives? Uh, well, I think I think that that one takes a little bit more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> about a so, full semester's worth of listening yeah. to it a hundred times <laughs> well you know that's the that's another weird thing about Isis music um it was basically premiered backwards so the the most challenging difficult pieces were the ones that were presented first mm -hmm. and the earlier much more tame works were, you know, were, were performed much later mm -hmm. so um I would have had a very different kind of reception, a very different kind of career if the music that he'd been writing since the 1890s had been performed all along. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, the, one of the very first pieces, big pieces of Ives that gets played is the first two movements of the Fourth Symphony, which is about as wild and crazy as he got, mm -hmm. yeah. especially the second movement. And then the Conquered Sonata is the first big piano piece that, that gets performed. And it has some very, like the Alcott movement, very sedate and beautiful moments, but then it also has some you know, really, real craziness going on that's probably not the very first thing you would would present to, to um, the uninitiated. I wonder how... Uh... The Beatles but would have been received if they came out with Sgt. Pepper in 1961 instead exactly. of 1967. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's that's very or or like you know if the very if Beethoven's very first piece had been one of his late string quartets, mm -hmm. um, that that would not have done the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's funny. You can uh, you can listen to that second piano sonata for a whole semester and then still misidentify movements of it on a listening exam. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, but, you know, maybe by now you know it well. <laughs> yeah, but I, I echo what you said about the the songs. They're they're a good starting point, um, you know, to get in because they're they're so diverse in style. And I feel very fortunate that actually, uh, how kind of opposite to what Chris was saying, my teacher in in undergrad um, really encouraged all his trombone and euphonium students to play songs on recitals and study them, you know, for expressive playing, which hint, hint is what my dissertation is all about. But um, uh, yeah, so he actually played some Ives on trombone in, mm. a, in, in a couple of recitals, some, some of the Ives songs. I forget which ones exactly, but um, but they, they came across really well. Um, yeah, the, the, the songs are great. I mean, like you said, many, many different styles to kind of latch onto there yeah, in that my, collection. My wife, who is an oboist, um, um, did a recital when she was in graduate school of, of all songs and yeah. she did an on set it was really nice they, mm -hmm. they, a lot of them worked well as a as a, you know, an instrumental presentation right yeah This has been a, a great conversation. We really thank you for taking the time out of your uh, busy, you know, lead up to the fall semester where you're doing lots and lots of planning uh, to talk with us. So we, we really thank you for your time and, and your your all your expertise on George and, and Charles Ives. Um, where can people go to find out more about um, your your the research you've done, the the book of correspondence that you edited? Where where's a good place to point people to if they want to uh, dive into that stuff? Sure. So, um, a, well, a good kind of general um, source for for Ives is the the Charles Ives Society, um, and they have a website. We have a website mm -hmm. um, that has a lot of materials. Um, so that would be um, I think it's just CharlesIves.org. Um, mm -hmm. 
There, I, I did um, a number of years ago now, a collection of Ives resources um, for Oxford bibliography online. And okay. so uh, you can, can go to that and see um, sort of by category, a bunch like if you're, if you're interested in biography or if you're interested in um, looking at, you know, um, stuff about the piano sonatas or whatever it is, band music, you can go up there and, and look for stuff that way. Um, mm. And that's just through the, if you have access to the Oxford Music Online um, mm -hmm. site uh, through a university library or something like that. Um, and then um, I'm hoping to do a, a, another Ives seminar in the next couple of years. I um, don't know when it actually will be, but I'm, I want to do one on the songs next. That's my mm. that's my, my next um, idea in terms of, of teaching uh, teaching Ives, which I try to do somewhat regularly, but not so often that people get sick of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, the correspondence book um, is uh, available. Um, through University of California Press, uh, um, although I think now you can probably find it on Amazon for fifteen cents or something. So. <laughs> well, I'm wondering is there is there a location uh, that best benefits you yeah. of where we get that? Or uh, well, I, I, I'll say one that I have in my basement. No, <laughs> 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 I'll sign it for you. Ooh, no, you no, there's no not, there's <laughs> any any difference. Um, from the, of the various um, of the various options, every once in a while I'll, I'll get a a, a check for, or a a, 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 a a statement of my account from the from the publisher, and it's always you made you know seventy five cents this quarter or whatever. <laughs> there you go. Also, yeah. it sounds like from the publisher directly might be the best. So we'll in our link we'll include the publisher link versus like okay. an Amazon link. Just, <laughs> just to, the, so we can bump you up to that full dollar for now. Oh, right. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Half a cup of coffee. There yeah. you go. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Well again, thank you so much, Dr. Owens, for coming on to the Early American Brass Band podcast. Uh Steven mentioned it a few minutes ago, but I'll echo it that we really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your expertise and, and your time. Uh, with this discussion. So thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's been a blast. This episode's featured album is Charles Ives' America, recorded by the President's Own United States Marine Band in 2003 under the direction of Colonel Timothy W. Foley. This album contains a number of pieces originally composed for band, as well as new transcriptions for concert band. It's a great recording that I think that you will all enjoy, and it, as it was mentioned by Dr. Owens, is a great introduction for many people to the music of Charles Ives. You can stream the album on YouTube, and we will have links to that in the show notes for this episode, which you can find on our website, www.eabbpodcast.com. Be sure to follow the show on all social media platforms and YouTube to stay up to date with all of our releases and extra tidbits. You can also support the show on Patreon and Teespring. The intro and outro music was provided by the 8th Green Machine Regiment Band from George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. The interlude music was provided by the President's Own United States Marine Band in Washington, D.C. This episode was made possible by the support of our patrons on Patreon. 